Hi, it's Monday, May the 6th, and I continue to read and wonder my way through Luke's Gospel. And today we're in Luke chapter 18, verses 18 to 27. Um, last Friday we had heard about uh, parents bringing their children to Jesus, and the disciples tried to stop them from doing that, and Jesus said, nope, I want the kids. And in fact, saying that it, that that we must be as little children to, to enter the kingdom of God. And so we did some wondering about that, and uh, well... And then this is what happens. So here it is, Luke 18, 18 to 27. A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. He replied, I have kept all these since my youth. And when Jesus heard this, he said to him, there is one, still one thing lacking. Sell all you own and distribute the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. But when he heard this, he became sad, for he was very rich. And Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard it replied, Then who can be saved? And Jesus replied, What is impossible for mortals is possible for God. So, there's a good chance you're familiar with this, with this passage. Um... <laughs> I mean, I've known this, this since I was uh, a, a little kid. Um, and it's told in other Gospels too. Uh, so so a rich man, here a certain ruler. So somebody with, with power. And and comes to Jesus respectfully. I mean, there's no reason, you know, I, I have talked about, you know, reading sarcasm and irony into some of the things before. I don't think this is one of those things. I don't think this is sarcastic. I think this is sincere, but at least that's how I'm reading it. Um, maybe if I read it sarcastically, it would be different. I'm not sure. But for me, this is, this is a, a sincere request. Good teacher. He means it. You're, you're a teacher. You are good. Um, and by good, I don't think it just means, um, that you convey messages well. Uh, I don't think it just means that you are of moral uprightness. Uh, it's just, no, what, what comes from you is, is holy and and clearly from God, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Kingdom of God, we were just talking about eternal life. Again, some people think of both those things as being heaven. I'm not sure that eternal life is heaven or even living forever. For me, when I hear those words, it is, it is living with that awareness of God in the world. That's where life takes on an eternal nature. When I recognize that there is a depth, there is a spirit to in the, in the world around me. And I can wander along the surface of it and occasionally notice that that, that tree looks nice and those flowers are pretty. Um, but when I am able to see God at work in the world, when I am able to see the trees and the sunrise and the air that I breathe and the water and all the people around me, when I'm able to see us connected through and by God, that to me is is a sense of, of the eternity. Um, I am not afraid of of death um, when I really grasp that. Those those kind of things. So to me, that's what we're talking about. <clears throat> um, so good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. So right there. That sounds like a bit of a rebuke, you know. So, so maybe, maybe we could read it sarcastic. Oh yeah, good teacher. You know, why do you call me good? Uh, and only God is good. Maybe. But for me, when I hear those words, I hear Jesus not challenging, but trying to open up this person's mind. Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. For us, as a statement of faith. God and Jesus are one. 
Um, if I want to know about God, I need to know Jesus, right? It, 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 that, that works for me. If I, as long as I know Jesus, then I know God. I want to know the character of God. I, I learned that, uh, the character of God by learning the character of Jesus. Jesus and God are one for me. But perhaps I can know God and it's not just through Jesus. Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. So is this an invitation to recognize that yes, whereas, whereas Jesus absolutely conveys the wholeness of God to me, we don't have to, we don't have to make that um, a necessary connection, a necessary statement. That is to say that it is possible to know God and not know the name of Jesus, not to have read scripture, not to have experienced these things, that it is God that we want to know. Good teacher. Well, yes, but, but, but it's the teaching that is revealing God to you, not, not me. I'm not, I'm not magic. Now that becomes tricky because again, I'm a Trinitarian. Uh, my faith has led me to, to appreciate that Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit are one. Um, they are, they are God. They are the compassionate love that binds together the universe that, 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 that creates all. Um, they are where I begin. They are where I reside they are where i am going they that's that's for me and and words can't fully describe it so it's a big thing for me to read a piece of scripture that says well yeah but maybe if you took jesus out of that equation it could still work i can't comprehend how that still works because because jesus works for me but i hear a bit of a hint that Jesus is saying, yeah, this works, but focus on God, not on me. And if Jesus is saying that, then that would suggest to me that there may be other ways that I may come to God. I don't need those ways. Um, and I'm not going around saying for all those who have found God in Jesus and are, are in good relations, oh, don't... You didn't have to. There is another way, an easier way, a different way. I don't, what I'm saying is that in my humility, I recognize that I don't know everything there is to know about God. And that God and God's grace will be revealed as God chooses to be revealed. That has been in Jesus and continues to be, is in Jesus. No question for me. But are there other ways that God is manifest and revealed. And I can't say no to those things. And for me, that's what Jesus is saying right there. Can't say no to those things. Why are you calling me good? It's, it's, it's about God, not about, about me. So hearing that, just wondering about that. Now we go on and, and Jesus is, is instructing and I think he's instructing the the uh, the certain ruler um, compassionately, kindly, saying, "Okay, so you know the commandments, you know you you have a path, right?" And this path, by the way, was was set before Jesus was before Jesus was uh, uh, was in the world, um, you know, birth in Bethlehem and all that stuff. Before that, because the this is this is Hebrew scripture, <clears throat> this is um, Mosaic law. Uh, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. So Jesus has said, don't focus on me, focus on God. By the way, the old way is valid. Jesus seems to be talking himself down here a fair bit. Um, but then the certain ruler says, but I've kept all these since my youth. Now, this would be a, a tempting moment for one of my Christian friends to go, yes, but you have not accepted Jesus in, in, into your heart. And if you do that, then you get it. This would be a time for Jesus to say, yes, but if you would recognize who I am, then you would do it. 
um, that would be sort of the Jesus reform to, to Judaism. So yes, you've done all those things and good for you. Now, if you understand that I, uh, that I fulfill all of the law, uh, and the prophets, if you would recognize that I am God's, God's movement in the world, then you'd get, but Jesus doesn't say that. <laughs> Jesus doesn't. Jesus is looking at this person compassionately. You know what? There's one thing lacking. Sell all you own and distribute the money to the poor. And then you'll have treasure in heaven. Then you'll have that eternal life. Then you will have an investment in the life that is beyond this life. Right? Not the life, not the life waiting, but the life that is beyond, which is to say, I think it can be, it can be experienced here and now, but we have to see beyond where we see. We have to feel, we have to sense beyond what we sense. Right? And the way you're going to do that is distribute money to the poor. Right? Sell all you own and give the money to the poor. So that becomes a rallying cry for divesting of all things. <clears throat> And we in the Western world don't like that. <laughs> I don't know that anybody likes that. I don't know. Uh, um, I, I know that we struggle with that one. And, and I struggle with it too. Um, why? Because I don't want to sell all that I own? Maybe. Uh, maybe. Uh, although I don't own all that much. <laughs> um So I have heard preached and I have preached um, that Jesus is speaking to this man specifically and what this man needs to do, this certain ruler needs to divest himself because he is too focused on his money, that his money, his wealth, his power have become his God and he cannot fully connect to God until he lets them go, right? Abraham is a rich man, but Abraham is not fixated on his wealth. He recognizes his wealth as something that God has given him to share, much like this man is being invited to do. Right? So it's not being rich that's the problem. It's your fixation on it. I don't think that that's wrong. Um, it goes on to say... Um, well, goes on to say that, that he can't do it. He becomes very sad. Um, and uh, he, he's, he becomes sad. And Jesus says how hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Whoa, we know that past that statement. And what really makes me laugh. Uh, okay, so. Easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Sounds like if you're rich, you can't go to heaven. Again, I don't believe the kingdom of God is is heaven. I believe the kingdom of God is 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 the life beyond this life that we can witness and experience here and now. It's about seeing the greater depth. It's about feeling that relationship with God. It's about seeing God in the world. It's about being part of all of that. It's so that's the first thing. So if that's the case, um, then it's not, I'm not then for me it's not saying if you're rich you can't go to heaven and yet there were people who of course on their deathbed gave away everything so they would be poor and be able to get to heaven I think it's a bad reading of this scripture um, and similar scriptures to this that appear in the other gospels um, and then we get all sorts of stories about oh yeah okay, what you don't understand is uh, the eye of the needle. Um, is is a is a gate in Jerusalem, and a fully laden camel can't go through it. The camel has to kneel down and get through it, and that's what it really is. It's all about actually this gate, and everybody at the time would know that it's a gate. Okay, so the knee the and the camel has to kneel, so we have to kneel. We have to humble ourselves. Yeah, but it's the camel that has to. Okay, then he said, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, it, it's not that at all. Uh, it, it's, 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 uh, it, it's the camel. It's actually a camel rope. So what, it was, what it's saying is it's easier to thread a needle with a rope than it is, for a, than it is to get into the kingdom of God. And then, and then people will talk about that. Um, so what I can say with a little bit of certainty uh, is that the whole um, 
Jerusalem Gate, known as the Eye of the Needle, that a camel had to kneel down to get through. Uh, that story was not known by anybody until the 1800s, and it was a, I believe it was a, a, a priest in England who, who who told that story, and everyone, oh, there you go. There's no history. It just, as far as we can tell, made it up. Uh, and people went, oh yeah, that's what it is. Um, yes, you can play the translation game and go, okay, so it's it's camel rope, it's not a camel. Um, so, but all of that is a complete, to me, a distraction. What it's saying is, it's very difficult. Period. Whether we're talking about trying to thread a needle with a rope or get a camel through a, a small uh, door in the wall, the fact is, it is hard for people with wealth to enter the kingdom of God, to inherit eternal life, to be in their best relationship with God. However you want to phrase that, that's to me what this is saying. It's saying it's hard. And it's harder for the wealthy than it is for those who have no wealth or power. But rather than confront that, we start talking about camels and needles and ropes. It's like, but it still says the same thing. No matter what you what you believe, it's the, still the same thing. It's hard, it's hard. So, and this whole story basically is saying that it's hard, not impossible. Who can be saved? They say. Well, what's impossible for mortals is possible with God. So it's not impossible. But why is it hard? And if I think I was being risky before by saying that Jesus says here, well, maybe you don't need Jesus to to uh, to know God, um, I'm going to go put myself even at greater risk. Uh, I think the passage indicates, suggests that wealth, money, power are addictions. Then they're horrible addictions. And. I'm speaking without experience. You can be addicted to heroin. And when you don't have it, you are physically ill and, and you're shaking and you are in pain. And when you do have it, you're smiling and you're happy. Um, but the thing is, you're still addicted to it. It's just that you are not suffering in the moment, but you're addicted to it. And ultimately, the heroin is going to kill you. It's going to kill you because you have too much of it. It's going to kill you because you run out of the supply of it. It's going to kill you because it rots your body and your mind. I think that what Jesus is suggesting is that, that wealth does the same thing. This is going to seem very anti-capitalist, and that's where I'm going to get into more, even more trouble. It's For lots of Christians, well, okay, you can take Jesus out, but don't you dare take capitalism out. That is the essence of freedom. Uh, free market, that's who we are. I don't think Jesus believes in free market. I don't think Jesus believes in capitalism. Now, having said that, I'm not saying Jesus is anti-capitalism. I think that Jesus... I think that Jesus is available to us in any system. That's why when they tried to make him king, Jesus disappeared and ran away. Jesus does not want to rule. Jesus is available to all of us in any, in any system. But every system has a problem, and, and all of us struggle. So Jesus is looking at this system and saying, yeah, um, clinging to wealth and power, making wealth and power your motivations, it's an addiction. Uh, when I started, my first church was was in one of the wealthiest communities uh, in in Canada. Uh, so I, I started my ministry, professional ministry at Ju at Rosedale United Church, um, and I had colleagues and friends who came out of seminary with me. Going, oh yeah, sure, yeah, see, lie right. You take the cushy one. That's not real ministry. For them, real ministry was where people didn't have money. Um, so, wanting to work with the poor. I completely understand that. Um, that is a great motivation uh, in ministry. It's a great motivation for Christians, people of all faiths. 
absolutely to be with those who are without. Um, but when they implied that there was no real ministry to be done with people who are rich, they were revealing that they believed money could solve problems. They believed that money could fix spiritual dilemma. So in a sense, their attitudes were still addicted to the idea that money can buy you happiness. Money can buy you good relationship with God. Money can solve problems. And in fact, it doesn't, and it can't, and it won't. But the more you believe that it will, the deeper that addiction gets, and the harder it is to recognize God in the world. Because you're convinced that the, the answer to your problems is in a lottery ticket and not in prayer. You believe that, you know, the answer to your problems is selling up, not in being part of God's justice in the world. And it's a very difficult addiction. Uh, and I, I mean, I, I try to manage it, but I am addicted to it. I absolutely am. I put money aside in a pension. I save money. I like to have money so I can buy my granddaughter things. I, I like to be able to, you know, um, I, I'm much happier not worrying about this month's rent uh, than I was years ago when I was worrying about the rent. So I do have that addiction. One of the things you can do is to go cold, cold turkey, which is what he's telling this certain fellow. Sell everything, distribute it to the poor, be like Abraham, be vulnerable and open. Let's see how society, how your friends, how God will help support you. Um, I don't go cold turkey, but I try to moderate it. I try to make sure I'm not too fixated. So I try to, to share of my wealth and to not think of it as my wealth. But again, try to think of myself as a steward of what I have. And I, I relapse every now and again. There are times when I lose track of it. I absolutely do. And it's hard. In fact, it's almost impossible. And then I'm reminded that what's impossible for mortals is possible with God. And so I do pray and I do talk to God and I do work with God at understanding how I can be in relationship and how and, and recognizing how my wealth, my power, my position, my privilege, all of those things get in the way. And so I try to divest myself of them. It would probably be faster if I lost them all. But I'm afraid of losing them all. Uh, and so I work at it. This is a very challenging story for me. Um, it tells me that the things about which I am certain, I should not always be certain. There are other ways, perhaps, to experience God. Uh, there are other ways to live in the world than the way that I do. And in fact, I might even know a better way, but I don't want to do it. What I get out of this, though, is that Jesus spoke to this person, this certain ruler, compassionately and told him what to do. He did not say, go away, you have disappointed me. He simply said, you are choosing the hardest way. Hmm. I'm going to stop right there. I think that that's enough for the moment, and I'm going to leave it with you. See what you make of this. Because uh, this isn't something that has a simple answer for me. Um, but it's something that makes me think. And every time I think about this passage, I reflect on my life and I make little changes. Little changes. And I start to get a little bit better. Yeah. Let me offer a prayer. Loving God, thank you. Thank you for the challenges and and the hard bits of scripture and life. But thank you even more for being with us as we struggle. As we struggle to, to prioritize and grow our relationship with you. As we struggle to embrace 
an eternal view of life and not be distracted by the simple things, the obvious things. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's enough for me today, but I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Uh, let's see where it goes tomorrow. Um, hoping for a little more good news, because this is a tough one. Um, anyway, please, um, until I see you, God bless. Please know that God sees you, knows you, and loves you exactly as you are. Uh, and, and, that, and that God's love not only comes to you and resides in you, but moves through you into the world. Uh, it, 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 it is distributed to all the people that you connect with. You, you help share the love of God in the world. So thank you for that. That's what it is to be a blessing. So God bless you, and we will see you tomorrow.